This book actually is uh, my 16th book, uh, but it's totally different than all other 15. Because uh, I feel with all other 15, really I was dancing to the rhythm of uh, 19th century European organ music, <laughs> which I like, but, uh, but with this book I feel uh, now I'm starting to dance to the beat of the Palestinian drum, mm. which is the main instrument in, in the Middle East. Because mm. you know, if, if, uh, if you like me study in, in, studied in Germany, if you would have studied in Germany, uh, you know, you put a lens on and you think, this is the theological lens, and if you want to be kosher, this is the way you have to think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it took me maybe over 20 years to be able to get rid of this <coughs> lens and to put another lens that will look at the Bible through Palestinian eyes. And uh, uh, I think what, what that uh, uh, really uh, meant for me is uh, <coughs> I have to, re to take the realities of Palestine uh, really seriously in any theological development. And so with this book, uh, I don't start in heaven with theology but on earth, and not only on earth actually, uh, I think it's the only book so far, a uh, theological book, that starts with geopolitics. <laughs> so the approach uh, is a different approach. And why is geopolitics so important? Because uh, what I'm saying there, if you look really at, at the geopolitics of the Middle East, uh, Palestine is a tiny little country. I mean, it's smaller than Long Island, mm -hmm. small, uh, yet surrounded by five regional powers, and these powers were just alternating who controls and occupies Palestine. And so it started basically with the Assyrians, 722, I mean, as, as theologians, you know, we learn this all right with the Assyrians, then came the Babylonians, 587, then the Persian, 538, then the Greek, 333, then the Roman, then the Byzantine, then the Arabs, Crusaders, I, I skipped a few, <laughs> Ottomans, British, and, and this is new actually, actually Israel. Because we never actually learned to put Israel in the same line with all other empires that occupied Palestine. Mm -hmm. Because we were always looking at Israel today being in connection to the Israelites of the Bible, not with the empires who were controlling Palestine. But actually, if you students of political science anywhere in this country, you would know that uh, Israel actually is part of European colonial history of the 19th, 20th century. Yes. And according to international law and UN here uh, a few blocks away, uh, Israel is an occupier force, occupying force. And so I think this is really new because as theologians we were somehow so corrupted uh, to really uh, to live in a kind of schizophrenia. Because what I'm saying in, at the beginning of the book is that if you study theology, like most of us here, you know, really history starts with Abraham and ends around the second uh, Jewish revolt, 132-135. So for us as theologians, this is history. But if you move among political scientists, for them history starts in the 19th century with the Zionist movement and goes on today. But 
these are two different realities. They are totally not related to each other. And no one takes the time in between seriously. But as I said, for us as people of Palestine, actually we were just, you know, saying goodbye to an empire just to say welcome to the next. Mm. And I think we have to take this really seriously. Uh, what does it mean, actually, if you are Palestinian, now, or if you are part of the people of Palestine, irrespective of not only in the modern day Palestine, but throughout history, uh, part of the reality that, that is shaping your, your whole being is being occupied. I mean, we can count the years, uh, literally, where maybe Palestine was not occupied. I don't think even there was time when Palestine had, was not occupied. And so this reality, actually, uh, is what led, I think, to the writing of the Bible. Without the, this imperial experience, we would not have the Bible. Because the Bible is, as you know, is a product of Palestine. It has nothing to do with the Bible Belt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thanks God. I mean, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, because if it were developed in the, in the Bible Belt, it would not really have that same message. And so, for me, the Bible was nothing but the response of the people of Palestine to that reality of living under the empire. And in fact, this is something we, we really don't think about it enough, but, but I mean, knowing that Jesus actually was born under occupation, lived his entire life under occupation, and was crushed on the cross by the empire. This is actually something you know, I share. We all, as Palestinians, share with Jesus. And uh, so, this is why, I mean, if you think of what was the message that Jesus went on proclaiming throughout Palestine, very simple, it was the message about the kingdom of God. And we cannot understand the kingdom of God unless we understand the empire. Because the kingdom of God was actually a critique to the empire. The idea was that there should be something that is bigger than the empire. There should be something that is more powerful than the Caesar. And this is actually what Jesus was proclaiming. And so if you start looking at the Bible through these eyes, you will actually come to, uh, to notice that uh, if you really want to understand what the Bible is saying today, it's almost prerequisite to listen to the experience of the Palestinians in general and the Palestinian Christians in particular. Why? Because they live in very similar circumstances like the people in the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament and like the first church under Roman Empire. And so they can relate actually, and so they can hear things differently than we hear it if we sit in an area where, you know, imperial domination is not part of our experience. And so this is really uh, the, the approach uh, I'm using with this book. And um, I think what is really fascinating is the answer that, that the Bible gives. Because if you live under this imperial rule all the time, uh, the question rise, rises, where are you, God? Uh, and uh, believe me, this is uh, uh, something I hear every day. When I go to a checkpoint and I see uh, a Palestinian woman with her dress being humiliated by a young Israeli soldier, uh, often, you know, she would look into heaven and say uh, in Arabic, Weenak ya Allah, where are you, God? <laughs> And I think the discovery that our forefathers and foremothers did 
was not that there is a God. That's boring. And not that, that there is only one God. That's boring. But they were able actually to spot God where no one else was able to spot him. To spot him in the powerlessness. Because that's our experience. To, to spot him in this helplessness that people feel. And so, our forefathers and foremothers were able to see God going with them in exile rather than just making sure that they would not be sent into exile. Uh, they were able to spot him in Jerusalem when Jerusalem was totally destroyed by the Babylonians and the temple was burned down. They were able to see him there. Which means they learned actually to see God not in the victory, but in the defeat, because our history is, is a series of defeats, if you want. It's a bit different than maybe the American way of thinking, because you always think of victory, victory, victory. But I think the message of the Bible actually is, is God is there where no one would expect him. And this is why actually the climax of this, uh, of this message could not be but to proclaim the crucified Lord, which is the ultimate powerlessness on the cross. Uh, the moment that, that the empire was able to silence <coughs> Jesus, the disciples were able to see in that moment the victory of God, which is a revolution because, I mean, it doesn't make sense. And this is why it is foolishness for the Greek and it is stumbling block for the Jews. Even for us, I think it's very difficult to, to digest. And this is why I think uh, uh, just to think of how our forefathers were able to take this message and to go out of Palestine and to proclaim, not to proclaim a victim of the empire, although Jesus was a victim of the empire, but that's not the, the, the issue, but to proclaim the crucified risen. And I think that's really what, what is so amazing. That's the good news that came out of Palestine. And, uh, and I think this is the message that we in Palestine have to keep working on and to keep uh, uh, talking about. So for me, this approach uh, is really uh, important because it is like you see things, you start to see things upside down. Uh, for me, it's, it's down upside, it's not upside down. Uh, because this is actually how it was meant originally, I think. And uh, I'm, I, I know this is going to be very challenging for many people because this is not how we were trained to look at things. But I hope it will open doors for, uh, for people to look into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with new eyes. But also to help people uh, become proactive, knowing that they are not spectators in this world, but actors. And I think this is really important for us as pastors because, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, if it were just a conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, we would have solved it a long time ago. The problem is that the international community keeps subsidizing the occupation. I mean, it's really the empire that, that, that helps this occupation to continue. And so, uh, if, if, if you see that, uh, uh, you will notice that the international community <coughs> provides the hardware for the occupation to continue. I mean, these are the F-16, you know, the submarines, all of these toys that Israel gets for free. But even more difficult is that the church and the theological seminaries are providing the software for this hard work 
where to work. And I think we really need, as theologians, to think about it. Are we really part of the problem in the sense that we are providing the software? The software meaning uh, when we preach on Sunday morning to people in the pew, people in the pew, but also we ourselves as pastors, subconsciously keep somehow connecting the biblical Israel with today Israel. And so we are allowing this occupation to continue out of theological conviction. And we don't see actually that Israel is part of the empire and that actually it's the Palestinian voices that we have to pick up. Because that, they continue that tradition we find in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And in the last chapter, <coughs> uh, I talk about imagination and hope because uh, the question is, can we imagine and think of the unthinkable? Or are we stuck for eternity in this history of imperial rule? Or can we think of something new? Can there be a new reality? <coughs> uh, and I think this is exactly what all the time the prophets of Palestine were saying, that actually we can think of the future totally different than the past. And we are no spectators in this world, but we are actors, so we can take a stand and we can. So, in that sense, it's an invitation, actually, to engage socially, politically, uh, religiously in that part of the world, and to believe that you can make a difference as individuals, but also as churches, as congregations, uh, as, as Americans, etc. So, uh, that's in a nutshell maybe something about the background of this book. Uh, I don't want to, to bother you with, with, with more, but I think we have still some maybe 15 minutes for, for a few questions. If you have some, please feel free to, to ask anything you always want to do. You have to come. I will come and be